So that like really hypey, fun entertainment aspect, I think that's dying off a little bit and we're getting a bit more practical around how we use quizzes as a tool and not just as a form of, you know, wasting a few minutes and getting a quick dopamine hit. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Interact Podcast. Today I'm here with Shanti Zach. She's a quiz funnel expert and has been working on quizzes since 2016. Did we meet in 2016? Was that also the year that we met? Yeah, I think so. That's crazy. So Almost we've known each other for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> and have been in the same niche that didn't really exist when either of us got started. Interact started in like 2013. Um, and so it's kind of a great pairing over time. Shanti's worked on so many cool quizzes, and we'll get into that. Um, but I just wanted to have an on-record conversation talking through the state of quizzes for 2024. We're going into 2025. So welcome to the show, and I'm excited to chat. Yeah, me too. I can't so, believe we've known each other for that long. I know, right? It's <laughs> time. I don't know. Time is weird. It's, I agree. Very weird. How it moves so quickly. But I'm curious. So you're eight years into doing this. What's changed? Like, because I know a lot of things have changed on our end, but what's changed in what you're seeing and what clients want and what clients expect, what they're happy with, what they're not happy with, wherever you want to start there, what's, what's different? Yeah, I think so much has changed. I think we're coming out of the BuzzFeed era. So for such a long time, everyone's standard when it came to online quizzes was the BuzzFeed, which Powerpuff girl are you? What's your Harry Potter house? Like those really short, instant gratification quizzes that are mainly used as entertainment, a form of entertainment, right? We saw the uprise in that, and at a certain point, that was the most popular form of content for not just BuzzFeed, but even the New York Times at one, at one point. And I think we're coming back from that and coming back to quizzes as a broader tool for self-insight in specific areas. So that like really hypey, fun entertainment aspect, I think that's dying off a little bit and we're getting a bit more practical around how we use quizzes as a tool and not just as a form of, you know, wasting a few minutes and getting a quick dopamine hit. That perfectly reflects what we're seeing too. It's just like a shift away from the viral crazy hit i mean i've seen a couple that have really popped off in the last like year or two but it's pretty random now whereas mm -hmm. new york times i think there was even a couple years where all the top content on facebook like the top publishers on facebook were all quiz companies that right. was probably like 14 15 16 17 yeah since then it's totally changed so we're seeing a lot of the same stuff what are some ways that people are moving towards the practical? Like, are they implementing their products more into the quiz? Are they implementing services into the quiz? Are they finding ways to weave it more into their existing funnels? Like, what's different there? Yeah, I would say with the rise of e-commerce in general, the lean toward incorporating product recommendations into quizzes using that like as a primary tool to reduce analysis paralysis is probably the most practical and popular, right? Like we're just seeing that increase more and more and more. If you own an e-commerce store, you understand the power of helping people make the most appropriate product selection. So that's really pervasive. Um, before we like go fully there, I will say the entertainment aspect, I don't think that it's completely died, but it's changed a little bit in how, how we're approaching it. 
So what I'm seeing is it, it can still work, but it's mostly paired with short form video content, sort of driving traffic to that entertaining, fun quiz. So I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've come across her, but Harley Jordan, have you heard mm -hmm. of her? Okay, yeah. so this girl, like her quiz is very BuzzFeed-esque. It's like, are you a rabbit, a deer, a fox, or a cat? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And she really went hard on social, I think just reels. I don't even think she was on TikTok promoting it, but just talking about this idea in her social content and driving traffic to the quiz that way, and then creating a lot of content on this topic of these, these like dog or not, I don't even know if there's a dog, there's a fox for sure, because I know I'm a fox and there's a deer and a rabbit. And she created all this content around these different archetypes and put that out there in like various formats, video, carousel posts, information posts, all driving to the quiz. And that went mega viral. She has had tens of thousands of people take that quiz. So that's one example. Another one, like more on TikTok. I'll see a few, I've seen a few quizzes really rise in popularity because the content that the creator is putting out there speaks to the possible results that a person can get in the quiz. And then this curiosity loop is built, right? Like the, the viewer wants to find out, okay, which one am I? So people do this in ways where it's like, you know, I'll tell you the characteristics of each of these types right now, and you can kind of identify it from the video content itself, or I'll tell you the characteristics, but if you really want to know what you are, go take the quiz. So mm. like that is still happening, but these massive media brands pushing so much energy into quiz content that's what I think has died down quite a lot. So yeah, it's interesting to see the, the parallel between the rise of short form video content and, you know, quiz is kind of coming with it where it makes sense. Uh, another example of someone who's done really well with that, and this is actually a more practical example, is Tori Dunlap of her first 100K. She has a quiz that it's basically a, it's around money personality and it gives people a game plan to get out of debt, grow their wealth based on their money personality. It gives them some insights into that. And she goes hard with using that quiz as her main call to action in her social content. So she's had multiple videos go viral on TikTok talking about money and in in many of them in the caption it says go take the quiz if you want to find out how this applies to you specifically i think from one video she got a hundred thousand new subscribers from one viral tiktok it's crazy I've, yeah. yeah i spoke with harley a while back um that quiz is very cool and just hearing about like how that came about super awesome it makes a lot of sense what you're saying though and it's it's kind of all the same in my head where it's like it's moving towards the practical so the practical is like based on which of these animals you are it actually has a practical implication in terms of your personal branding which is what yeah. she does and then with tori with the money personalities like based on this personality it totally changes how you should approach building wealth mm -hmm. and so it's like it's starting with the thing that they actually help people do yeah instead of kind of what used to happen where it was just like almost random and mm -hmm. then like some tiny percentage of people would overlap and 
you'd call it a day because it's like if a million people take it and 50 of them are great fits then fine yeah but it's not really like how it works anymore and i think a lot of the algorithms are kind of moving that way too yeah so, totally yeah, yeah it's this move from quantity to quality and i think that is a wonderful thing like we're preaching to the to the choir when we talk about alignment and making sure that whatever your quiz is about it aligns with what your business is about and what you actually sell and what you actually help people with so i think that the the collective is catching on to that the importance of that yeah and i think there's even a role of ai in that right where it's like if you're putting out stuff that's generic someone can just go ask chat gbt and get a generic answer and that's not going to be any different than what everyone else has access to i almost think of ai as like a flattening of the playing field whereas yeah. before you could almost be different just by putting out a huge volume of content because that was hard ish to do now yeah. it's not at all hard to do and so it goes back to like what is actually unique about the value that you offer but then with a quiz you could offer like four unique values as quiz results instead of only being able to talk about one thing it's kind of like the limitation of just creating one piece of content right you can have the different outcomes so that's a good point i hadn't thought about it that way but then circling back to your comment about analysis paralysis are you familiar with that jam study the one where they tested out 20 options for jam versus six options for jam no this is like a it was a year 2000 study i think stanford and columbia collab where they went to farmers markets and they put out 20 types of jams and then they tried putting out only six and when they put out six they sold three times more mm, because yeah. there's less options yeah. And that study, for whatever reason, just randomly got renewed in 2024. The same people were like, let's see if this is still true. And it, it basically doubled down. Like, it's more true now than oh. it was back in the year 2000, which makes sense given the proliferation of just, like, there's content for everything now. Um, do you ever struggle with this, though, with your clients where – because the premise of a quiz is paring down into fewer options, clients have a hard time being like, well, I want to say this and this and this and this. And then the quiz becomes this like behemoth of content that actually ends up in the same place where there's too much stuff. Yeah, totally, totally. And I think that people are like people and this is going to sound so obvious, have shorter attention spans, right? Yeah. And one way that it was, like you said, easier to stand out, even just a few years ago, was to be putting out a quantity of content. And, you know, ideally, it's also high quality. But now, even if it is high quality, if it's also large in terms of quantity if you land on a result page and it's like basically a novel then we've lost them before we've even got them so but absolutely there is this desire with clients and i mean i even find it with it with myself to give so much in that first interaction because for so long as online marketers we've been taught to show so much value in the first interaction that we have with a potential customer and now it's actually like no we need to pair this back and make sure it is ultra specific and as impactful in as few words as possible. And that is actually, interestingly, 
easier for some personality types than for others. So what I find is like people who are like high D, very type A, who they themselves consume information in like a very quick get to the point kind of way, have no issue with their own content reflecting that style. Whereas people who are more emotional and introspective and, you know, we could offer the quality of depth, like people who are deeper and like really want to get into it right away, they have a harder time with that. And, you know, I think it's challenging to find the balance because, oh, and then we could even go into like the more analytical type of person who's actually more about like numbers and stats and like, let's give them the step-by-step. -step. Like these are all very different styles of content, right? And in a perfect world, we can have a combination of all of them. We can speak to all different personality types within our content and we can remove the bias of this is how I like to consume information. Therefore, all of my potential customers are the same because we know that's not true, right? But that's where like, it's like the art and the science sort of mesh together. And ideally we can create something that is punchy to the point, impactful, not overly filled with unnecessary words and fluff and information that's not pertinent right now, but we can also connect to like the emotional people with impactful stories and testimonials. We can also connect to the more analytical people with stats and numbers and evidence, and we can cater to different learning styles at the same time. So by learning style, I mean, some people like to like to read and some people would, would will never read anything. They just want to press play and listen. Right. So my goal is always like, let's cast as wide a net as possible in terms of connecting with different personality types and different learning styles. But but yeah, the trend I'm seeing is like if we go too far in one direction, especially with volume and quantity, we, we lose people. It's just the, the mental weight of another thing to sit and consume before we've proven that it's worthwhile. It's not going to happen. That's a very good point. I think the mental weight of another thing you have to consume is, is a great line because it does feel like that. And even societal shifts that have happened, like you just have to be so much more on your game with all the scams and the spams that are coming through. You have to read every email to make sure it's actually from the person that you think it's from. Yeah. And then you're being asked to like read something in order to, to solve a problem that you have or like get something that you want through the quiz. That makes a ton of sense. What you're saying about the different personalities and the different learning styles also makes a lot of sense, but it is a challenge, I think, and this is what you help customers with, but it's such a challenge to think about how do I address four different personality types and four different learning styles, but then keep my total result word count under 500 words. <laughs> yeah, It is yeah. a mind puzzle that... <laughs> I think is very fascinating, which is I've been doing this forever and you've been doing this forever. So you probably find it fascinating too, but mm -hmm. I don't know that most people would think that's very interesting to solve that problem. Yeah, exactly. I think most people and most business owners create content and, and quizzes included that reflects their style of learning and consuming information. I think that's pretty natural and often that can just be an extension of your brand and attracting people who are like-minded. And it's not that there's inherently something wrong with it. It's just, are we missing out on people who engage in different ways? Hmm. Yeah. 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 I hear that. And 
I think it is hard for a business owner. I mean, I put myself in the same boat. It's hard to get out of your head of what are the things that I want to convey to people because I know that's how I help them. Mm -hmm. And then flip over to someone who's brand new, who's coming across you for the very first time and think about what's in their head that's going to take them to a place where they actually want to work with me. And they're so far apart. And that always happens yeah. when I'm talking to customers about quizzes. It's like, well, I know what I want to tell people. This is how they're help how they I help them. And then I ask them this question. You probably have a very similar one, which is like, what's on your customer's mind that brings them to you? And they're like, yeah. uh, something totally different, hundred percent of the time. Yes, absolutely. This is such an old school copywriting adage, like to always be looking through the lens of what's in it for me, me being your customer and the person that you're talking to, right? And I think that like we're kind of experiencing a reckoning in the whole online space where the people who are able to hang on and succeed despite massive changes in every corner uh, are those who lead with like what's in it for me and who are answering that for their potential customers and able to get into that headspace versus what's in it for me as the business owner who wants to succeed and profit and wants it to be easy, right? I think there was a time when you could move a little bit selfishly through the world and it would still work, but it's not really working anymore. Yeah, I do feel like there's kind of, well, that's maybe not true. What I was going to say is that there's a shift away from like the cult of personality. I don't think that's ever going to actually go away, but unless you're in that very rarefied air of the certain people that can just kind of like be a larger than life individual and that just kind of works like people are attracted to that for whatever reason I, I in my experience that's such a tiny percentage of all people like maybe maybe half of one percent probably yeah. less and so if you're not in that then you really do have to think about like what do my customers really want what is what are they dying to have or what are they dying to solve in yeah. their life otherwise like nobody's gonna follow just your random musings about whatever because it's something that you care about yeah exactly i know it's a very small percentage of people who are charismatic enough to like build a successful business on the back of their personality and so this i think is a good a good point for anyone listening who's like, okay, like what's the practical application of this? When we said we're moving away from like the super entertaining, like hypey Buzzfeed style quiz to the more practical, in my mind, what that means is it can be as simple as your quiz is literally centered around the most burning question that your audience has, the question that people ask you again and again and again. And I love to use this example of this life coaching certification company that I worked with, Lumia. They, they found that the question they got asked most of the time on sales calls with people reaching out wondering, should I really get this life coaching certification was just that. Should I become a life coach? Should I really become a life coach? And if so, why? So the quiz we built for them was literally that question. Should I become a life coach? And one of the results was no, you should not become a life coach. You're just having a moment right now, but like, this is not probably not the best path for you. And then the three other results were based on ideal uh, 
client archetypes that they've worked with again and again and again. So for example, someone who's really just unfulfilled in their career, they have a passion for helping people. They're naturally, they're naturally a coach. They are the person that their friends call when they're in a time of crisis, right? Like that person is actually a great fit for becoming a life coach. Another archetype was um, social workers, therapists, people in HR, people who just want to build their skill set to be more successful in their existing career. So it's not necessarily that they want to quit their job and go and become a life coach. It's they just want to build their skills. So the messaging for those two archetypes, the answer is yes for both of them. But the reason behind the yes is different. And that's what the result focused on. It's like, okay, you told us all this stuff about yourself. Now we can reflect that back to you and affirm that this is a good path for you. And that quiz just absolutely crushed. Like, I think it, they got 80,000 new subscribers within like less than a year. And I, I think it's still live. This was like probably two or three years ago that we worked on it. But it's my favorite example of just having a clear question as the, the theme of the quiz itself. And they were getting people enrolling and, and saying yes to the life coaching certification, which is a big investment without even them getting on a sales call hmm. because we were able to answer that question for them. Hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. It has to be a burning question. And then if you can successfully answer it, like you're saying, and you can answer it in the context of like the stuff that they've talked about, then it's like, you're aligning with what they already want and they actually care about getting an answer to that problem or that mm -hmm. question and so it's just like cool it's like oh someone just told me this i forget who it was but they were like people want to be told what they already think and mm -hmm. if you can like ask them what they think and then tell them what they think then pretty much think you're a genius and you're like, I literally just listened to what you said and then repeated it back to you. So I'm just you talking to you. And of course you're like, Oh, that's the smartest person in the world. Totally. <laughs> so. Totally. Yeah. And like the irony of that is often we have to change what people think to a certain degree to get them mm. to say yes to working with us. Mm. And like, that's the, the, what does Eugene Schwartz call it? The levels of awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Like we as business owners and marketers are in the business of moving people from problem aware to solution aware. And that's a journey. So what I find really helpful with a quiz is when you can reflect back to someone what they already think and believe, like affirm them so that they don't feel like they're crazy. They, this creates like instant connection and rapport. Like you said, if, if you're having a conversation with someone and you're just repeating, and this is actually, I did that life coaching certification, by the way, with Lumia. And this is nice. actually a coaching tool, mirroring. So hmm. repeating back to someone what they said or like with my coach right now, she, she asks me to send voice memos, not for her, but for me. And, and she'll say, okay, that voice memo, that was actually like really good in insight that you had there. I want you to go back and listen to what you said, which is, is so funny because we think of, we think of coaching, we think of um, business solutions as like, tell me what I don't know. But it actually starts with, tell me what I do know. Affirm that I'm not crazy. Make me feel good about myself. And then we can start to move into some of the things that I might not actually know. So... I always try and start with the affirmation in a quiz result. 
and then tease a little bit about like, okay, but maybe you're not seeing this and that's what I can help you with. Hmm. Yeah. My coach does the same stuff. You know, look, <laughs> be like, remember you said this three months ago. And then also you said the same thing six months ago. And I'm like, ah, it's so annoying. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> old me was annoying. Uh, yeah. but <laughs> what, what there's a zone of tolerance. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of what you're describing. And I wonder if people are going around their day pretty much outside of their zone of tolerance, especially if it's during the workday. Mm -hmm. And if your quiz immediately hits them with like suggestions of things to do, yeah, they're outside of their zone of tolerance. So even if they think it's a good idea, they're not going to do it because they don't have any capacity. Yeah. So first, you got to move them back into the zone of tolerance window of tolerance and get some space and yeah. then introduce some ideas hmm. totally yeah and i think that that's reflected actually really astutely in the collective right now with a lot of the messaging that we're seeing that's working really well and that's like seems to be the most popular way to get buy-in from people is to give them a solution that fits into their zone of tolerance. And because we have so many options, we have so much on our plates, like the average person cannot fit another gargantuan task or endeavor into their life. And so we see that reflected in advertising in offers that seem to be working really well right now, which are like, do this in a few minutes a day, or, you know, this is an, a, a super easy three step solution to this actually complicated problem, <laughs> but we want to fit into your zone of tolerance. So we got to give you what you want before we can give you what you need. And that's, yeah everywhere right now yeah and then that almost goes into like habit formation because if you're going to form a habit which is like making your life better in some way and maybe that's what the the quiz results are actually recommending it's like you're this type do this to improve your anxiety or whatever there's a lot of anxiety quizzes right now mm -hmm. um, and if you're gonna form that habit then you gotta get some wins under your belt which is kind of like what you're saying. Like, yeah, you, you have to do something that gives you some sort of positive feedback. You can't just say meditate every day for 20 minutes for a month and then you'll feel better. Like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, totally. I think too, Josh, I'm curious what you're seeing, but zone of tolerance around pricing and investment. So. I'm just seeing this everywhere and like I've done it myself, these very low ticket offers that feel easy for people to purchase and ha have a very clear and specific outcome that's not too big of a lift, that's not going to require too much time and effort, and that's also not going to require too much financial capital. Yeah, that's like a huge trend across the board. And I would say a couple of things that we see, there's that, like there's a much higher bar for proving value now. Like the idea of a quiz three, four years ago, maybe longer, maybe like five years ago, was enough for someone to be like, sure, let me give this like a year shot. And what we did, speaking of the like super low whatever, we just made it free to use our entire platform. You can't launch the quizzes until you start like a trial on a paid subscription, but you can set up the entire thing. And we didn't have it like that before, but basically 
people started to signal like, I'm not going to start a paid trial unless I can see that this software does like exactly what I wanted to do. And that's the switch that we made to, to compensate for that. And then I think even with that, like the time is lengthened a lot for how mm -hmm. long people take to become comfortable. And the bar is higher in terms of like how confident people have to feel. We talk to like everybody that's interested in talking to us, but more and more people take us up on that because I think people just have this idea. Maybe it's like an idea that things need to be valuable, but also there's just more, there's more leverage. Like the, the weight has shifted. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think it was like pretty far on the other side there for a while, especially in the world of software. It was like, oh my gosh, you probably saw this, but like people used to just load up on software that they didn't use. And it was <laughs> very sad to see. I don't see that nearly as much anymore, which I think is a great shift in the right direction. Um, but honestly, I, I like this version. It's, it does remind me a lot of 2008, which is when I started my first company. Um, but what I really like about it is like, it's a fair game. Like you got to provide value for somebody to pay you. And there's more of an equal playing field where the, the big brand with the name isn't going to be able to charge 10 times as much just because they have the big brand with the name. People are like, yeah, I'll go buy the low ticket offer. I don't care who it's from if it, if it works. Yeah. I think that's way more interesting yeah. than uh, the other version. Yeah, totally. I agree. I have been in the boat of like majorly overspending on so many different things, software, coaching, because yeah, it felt like easy and like there's so much money coming in i'll just spend it right we're in times of abundance and we're always going to be in times of abundance and i think it's just human nature to think that this the stage we're in right now is the always stage like so far from the truth right but yeah i agree i i love that i can go and purchase a very specific solution to a specific problem and I don't have to spend thousands of dollars. Yeah, the bundling stuff during that crazy run up uh, that I mean, depending on which part of the software or business world you're in, I feel like that kind of started to taper off end of 21, 22, somewhere in there. That got nuts. Like, people were starting to just be like, you can only buy the bundle and the bundle is $3,000. And it's like, mm -hmm. why? I need like one small thing. It's yeah. crazy. Um, but shifting slightly over into just general business advice, what something you just said sparked an idea that I think is really important. This is kind of like a Warren Buffett thing-ish where it's like, you don't spend like it's a time of abundance when it is a time of abundance. Spend like you're in this time that we're in now where mm -hmm. like everyone is scrutinizing everything. And if you do that, it's just so hard to remember. It's like, yeah, everyone forgets. Like it always seems like things are going to go on forever, whichever version you're in. Like whether you're in the slow, it's like, oh, it's going to be slow forever. And it's fast. It's going to be fast forever. There's never yeah. the awareness. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then, I don't know if it's Warren Buffett, but like the parallel advice to that is just because we're in times of contraction doesn't mean we should completely stop investing and spending on marketing and growth, like the opposite, right? So yeah, it's really being choosy about where you're investing your time and energy and money for sure. But we can't we can't just be paralyzed in all departments yeah 100 percent. the um i don't know if you read this book made in japan it's about uh sony mm -hmm. and 
they started in 1945 Tokyo. So you can imagine there was not much of an economy for them to sell into. And they just tried a bunch of things. Like, can you think about Sony today? I mean, it's a long, a long time since then, but like they're known for just like, they've got the PlayStation, but they've got, you know, the TVs and they've got, they've got like so many random things. Mm-hmm. It's kind of from that ethos of like the story of that book is they just figured out what worked. Like they just kept trying things until they figured out what worked. And I think that's a big thing in in a time that does appear slower. It's, it's not so much that you stop. It's that you just try different things instead of just being like, oh, well, I have one offer that hits put $50,000 behind it. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't know what's going to hit in this time. Like, it's different. People want different things. They have different needs in this time. So maybe I'll put $1,000 behind 10 different offers and see what works in the, in the new economy. And there's no guarantee that that will work either. But yeah, I think it, it does. It does. Uh, I don't know the right emotion behind it, but like it it feels a little sad almost when I see people throw in the towel because it's like, you're really smart. You have a lot to offer to the world. And just because it feels hard because it's not like it was before doesn't mean you just completely shift. I mean, uh, this is like pontificating at a broader level, but so many people in the industry that that we both serve a lot, like in the coaching and you know, self help and that kind of space. So many people have gone back to the corporate world, um, yeah, and left their kind of businesses behind. Which I want to caveat that a lot. Like, if that is you know in service of your family and your life, that is one hundred percent understandable. Um, yeah, but at the same time, it's like when things shift, it's it's um you. you you have to figure it out just like you have to figure it out when things are good. It's just a little yeah. easier when things are good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that too, for sure. Lots of friends, lots of peers, lots of past clients who have had to like completely pivot. Um, and many of them go back to like a more traditional employment, but like, let's be real. It's not necessarily more safe or more sustainable. So I think for many of them, like it's still viewed as like an interim solution to create some structure and and cash flow in times of of like economic low. But yeah, it like it is disheartening when you've done something for a long time, it's worked well for a long time, and then it shifts. So to back to the trend and the practical. So for me. I had my main signature quiz course. I still have it. I'm doing like a big overhaul, but that's a $2,000 course. And I saw sales start to, you know, go down quite dramatically with that course. And lots of people saying like, it's just not, I just can't afford it. And so I created a mini course that is on the same topic. It's not nearly as in depth right? It's very much like the 20% that'll get you 80% of the results. And it's $37. And I sell that in my quiz results, one of my quizzes. And I call it an easy yes offer, these low ticket offers. And that course is so easy to sell. It is such an easy yes for people. It overcomes that objection of I can't afford this right now even if I think that what you're teaching could really help me and then down and it builds trust and down the line if they want to work with me in a more intimate capacity in a deeper way that option is still there but it takes a little bit more I find to create that connection and trust from the get-go So that's been working well for me. That's been working well for a lot of clients too. Like I'm really recommending every client have a low ticket, easy yes offer that's like hyper result specific in their quiz results. 
So we've got like the value, the, the connection based, often video and text that gives them insight into whatever it is, the, the reason they took the quiz. And then if they want to go deeper, there's an option for them to purchase something specific that solves a specific problem and go deeper. And this is solving another common problem of building an email list of buyers, not just an email list of people who just want more free stuff and mm. don't actually want to invest. And so again, with the quality versus quantity conversation, right? But this is working really well in combination with paid traffic efforts because another big change, paid traffic, meta ads, much more expensive than they used to be. And we, back in the day, and I still, I still hear some kind of crazy stories with people having still really low cost per lead with their quizzes, but even just like 2020, 2019, I, on average, would rarely see cost per lead of more than 50 cents. I had some clients like seven cents, 25 cents, just, just raking it in. Right. So big shifts in that, in that arena. And now it's pretty important that we can recoup some cost if we're running paid traffic fairly quickly, even if it's just to break even and reinvest knowing that like, the long-term growth and profitability is happening once someone's on your email list and you can build that relationship over time and offer them more profitable offers, right? Because like, let's be real, for many business owners, a $37 offer, no matter how much volume you have, is, is not gonna be a huge needle mover but that's not the point. So that's a, that's an important trend, I think, for people to know about. Um, I've seen it work too with the actual offer. The easy yes is a paid version of the results. So we may have talked about this before, but like one of my clients, he has this great quiz it's for people who are single and they really are in a season of improving themselves so they can find their ideal partner. So like very specific audience, very specific quiz, and they get their results. They get some insights into like, it's again, like tying in personality into how they should approach their single season. And then if they want like the full playbook, they can spend $5 and get the playbook, which is essentially a more detailed version of their results. And that quiz had super low cost per lead and actually was profitable right away because of that paid upgrade option. So, like I think the five dollar offer made like thirty grand in like the first month that he Whoa. ran it, and then really interesting, thirty percent of the people who said yes to the five dollar paid upgrade bought the bigger course, which was like a three hundred dollar course. So we're That's getting great. like little micro commitments along the way. And when you do that, it can work really well. And your paid traffic can be like, it's easy to invest more into ads when that's happening, right? So mm. yeah, kind of reverse engineering it a bit is really smart right now. Yeah, that's so cool. I, it's, I mean, we are living parallel lives because I see the exact same thing. I've started calling it a cascade of offers. Do you have a good branding for it? I haven't I haven't thought of any good branding other than cascade. <laughs> a waterfall. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the only that's the only one that's come to mind. It's like you have you do lead first, and then you do like five dollars, ten dollars, whatever, or in your case, thirty seven dollars for the like low one, and then you jump to two thousand, or you jump to three hundred, or you jump to whatever, and that makes a ton of sense. It's like old school sales, like that book, uh, Sell to Yes, I think is what it's called. It's like get a yes, get another yes, get another yes, get people saying yes, because. I don't know, like nothing's changed, right? Like people still want the same solutions. It's just maybe they feel burned by the previous era where they bought stuff that wasn't useful. So they want to be more, you know, uh, tepid this time and like kind of tiptoe into it. So Mm -hmm. if you give them an offer to tiptoe into it, that's kind of what they really want anyways. But, you know, you just got to go a little slower with it. Whereas before you could just kind of be like, here's the whole thing. And people would be like, great, that's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. The, the importance of proof Mm. and like resonance, I think is really coming into the spotlight right now. So Mm. yeah, if someone buys your $5 offer and they actually look at it and they actually use it and they actually get something out of it, then suddenly they've ticked off off this box of like, okay, this brand has proven to me that they create quality products and are in the business of selling real solutions. And that's like, yeah, like what you're explaining, doing that multiple times is kind of feels like what it takes right now. Yep. Yeah, I 100% resonate with that. And uh, I think that's a that's a good one to recap this on. Um, we could probably talk for hours about this stuff because it's so fascinating. Um, where can people go to see your quiz funnel into the low price course, into the full course? And if they want to just jump in and go, you know, full bore with you as well. Um, mm-hmm. where Where can people check that stuff out? Yeah, if you go to shantyzack.com, um, you'll you'll find many quizzes. I've got now a whole page, and I have every quiz of my own on there. Um, but the meta quiz, the what type of quiz should you create for your biz, that's the one that will lead into the little mini offer, and you can sort of like see it in action. Um, and then I have, a, I have also an example of a free a free quiz you get your result for free but then it invites you for $17 you can get the full paid full pdf of the results so that's my growth type quiz and um yeah that's a fun one too if you want an example of like that transition from free to paid quiz results because even i mean even the free version like and this is like my own bias with my own content is like I, my own bias is to always go long, always go deep. And so, but I pulled back a little bit. I, you know, have the shorter version of the free results. And then the actual paid version is like, it's like a 60 page PDF. It's like a workbook and there's wow. different prompts and stuff. And yeah. So it's a good strategy if you are the person who like really likes to go long and deep to like, okay, do that, but then take some of it and create a paid version so that like, it's not overwhelming someone who's not ready for that. It's only for the people who want more and who want to say yes to learning more. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And that's cool. Definitely. If you're listening, go check those out because it's so much different to see it in practicality versus just like hearing it and like hearing, you know, us talk about it. It's like when you see the flow and Shanti's flows are the ideal because he's been doing this forever. It's like when you see how it all goes together, it's, it really clicks. So definitely check that out. Um, Thanks for coming on. This is insightful to me. So I'm glad we got to, do this and i'm excited to see what happens uh in in the coming years yeah me too thanks for having me 